That's the name that we're celebrating in this season of the year. That's the name we celebrate every season of the year because that's the name through which we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and receive the salvation that he offers. We welcome our sanctuary children and youth this morning as they share another song of worship and praise to that name, the name above all names, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. out of turn, but they'll be here tonight, and what you have heard is just a part of the blessing that you'll receive by being present tonight. 
And so thank you, children and youth. We will dismiss them for their worship time. And uh, if you'll remain in standing in just a moment, we, as we go through the month of December, each Sunday we are going to be singing songs about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And hopefully by the time we get through the four Sundays, we will have covered all the songs. But no matter what you sing during the week, month, you have to begin with this song, Joy to the World, because Jesus Christ brought joy that nothing and no one else could ever bring. And unless and until you know him, you never really know what joy is all about. Join us as we sing, Joy to the World. Amen. standing with your Bibles open to the Gospel of Matthew. This is his account of the birth of Christ, and we begin reading at verse 18, and through this month, we will be looking at other records of the birth of Jesus Christ, but for this morning, uh, we are going to obviously be in the book of Matthew, and we'll be explaining to you a bit later why this book uh, is the first one in the New Testament. But from chapter 1, verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was his spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to to make her a public example, was minded to put her away quietly. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Father, we thank you for the written word. It gives us testimony to what happened and how it happened. Thank you, Father, today that we have not only the written word, we have the living word. Jesus Christ has come to live in our hearts 
he has come to reveal to us truth that we would not otherwise know. Indeed, natural man cannot know because they are revealed by the Spirit of God. So thank you in these coming weeks. We can look at a story that we have visited many times in the past, but today it is as though we are hearing it for the first time. And if anyone who hears this word has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, this has to be the moment. This is the hour. Now is the time. We pray, Father, that the Spirit of God will just bring his work of conviction and there will be a response to the Spirit. Obey the Spirit. Do what he says to do and do it now without delay, without hesitating. Thank you, Lord, for the time to worship, just the joy of being together with people of like faith and just to lift up, magnify the exalted and precious name of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen, amen. You may be seated if you would. It is a joy to greet you this morning. And in the last uh, couple of weeks, we have been blessed with showers of rain on the outside. And we have been blessed even more with showers of blessings on the inside. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We are blessed. Uh, we're blessed going out, and we're blessed coming in. <laughs> we're blessed when we're standing up, and we're blessed when we're sitting down, no matter what. God has blessed us beyond measure, more ways than we can know, more ways than we can count. Thanks to the sanctuary choir, the children, the youth this morning for leading us in our worship time. What you've heard this morning is but a small part of what you'll here tonight, and we pray that not only are you planning to be present, uh, but you are planning to invite someone to come with you. This may be the opportunity that you have to introduce them to the church. More importantly, it might be the opportunity you have to introduce them to the Lord. So don't miss that. Don't miss that. This is a time of evangelism tonight. This is a time when people are going to hear the gospel in song, but the gospel nonetheless. Thank you this morning for your presence here. I have been kind of prompted to make a couple of announcements that I usually don't do, but nonetheless, I'll highlight these. Please remember that the New Year's calendars are yours for the taking, one to a family. The offering envelopes are there for your benefit. That is important that you use those. And next Sunday morning, we will have after worship service, a soup and sandwich fellowship time and introduction to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And you are asked, please, if you would, sign up if you're planning to bring uh, soup. That's okay. Uh, if you do it, it's just good to know uh, what to expect. And uh, that way it helps me to know what to look for when I get to the line. So. Thank you so much uh, if, you would, if you would do that. And uh, we're just looking forward, excited about this time of the year, what the Lord is doing, and uh, to share God's word with you. I can tell you it's just a special privilege for us today. And so given the fact that our scripture uh, has been read, we've had our invitation and uh, I suppose that means uh, it's time for the sermon. And uh, so you all ought not cross me up like this. It just confuse me of what I'm, I'm a creature of habit. And I think we all are, but that's okay. That's okay. I just want to tell you that uh, talking to someone last week after the worship service, how many ways can you tell the Christmas story? How many ways can you tell about the birth of Christ. What can you say that hasn't already been said? But then I was reminded that some of the Christmas programs that we watch, uh, It's a Wonderful Life and so forth and so on, uh, they've been showing those since, what, 1940? And so we're not telling you probably anything you haven't heard. Maybe I'll be telling you 
in a different way, but I can tell you that each Sunday this month, I'll be sharing something with you about the birth of Jesus Christ. And whether it comes from the four Gospels remains to be seen. We'll just do, I'll just do as the Lord leads. You say, well, Pastor, you really don't have a lot of choice because Matthew and Luke are the only two that record anything about the birth of Christ. I beg to differ. Uh, Mark and John both talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, if the Lord so leads, we will get to that. But it's interesting because when you look at the scriptures, you wonder why did Matthew get bumped up to the first gospel in the New Testament, the first of the four gospels? Because clearly we do know that this was not the first gospel that was written. In fact, that belongs to the gospel of Mark. And uh, at the very best, at the very least, Matthew was the third gospel, and maybe even further down the line than that. But the writers who put the scriptures together knew exactly what they were doing. And I have to tell you, you've always been told if you're going to have somebody who is new in the faith, or maybe not new at all in the faith, don't ever tell them to start reading the Gospel of Matthew, because in chapter 1, you will hear a lot of so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so. And so what will happen is somebody starts reading that, and before you know it, they're going to begat disgusted, and they're going to quit. And so you want to send them to the Gospel of John. If there's somebody new in the faith, or if they've never made a profession of faith at all, you give them the Gospel of John. You tell them to read the Gospel of John. and But the Gospel of Matthew has its place, and rightfully so, by being the first book in the New Testament, the first of the four Gospels. Because in the closing of the Old Testament, there was a promise of the King that was going to come, the Messiah that was going to come. And here again, there have been 400 years of silence. Not a word from God for 400 years. It seemed like there were a lot of things going on that happened for 400 years, such as the people of Israel being in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. But at long last, the sound has broken. And the interesting thing is, when you read this, not only is it important that it be the first gospel in the New Testament, it is also important that they record the lineage as they did. Luke does the same thing, but Matthew traces it back to David. Matthew is presenting the fact that Jesus Christ was the rightful heir to the throne of David. He was not only the rightful heir to the throne of David, he was the rightful, owner, rightful one to serve as our great high priest. And he traces it all the way back to the kingship. Well, that side of it, interesting thing is, he talks about David, he talks about Aaron. And so when they go back, you have to understand and appreciate this also. In the Gospel of Matthew, we are told that there are 59 Old Testament prophecies that have been fulfilled. Mark comes in a close second, he has 30. And so when they look to the Old Testament, it was interesting, and I want to caution you about something. If you read the genealogy, genealogy in Matthew or in Luke, you need to know that there are some names that have been omitted. And uh, rightfully so, because it would be a list that would be far too great, far too long. But the interesting thing about this genealogy in Matthew is there are the names of four women. And in genealogies, the names of women were not included. And not only were there four names that were included, but it wasn't how many there were, it's who they were. First of all, there was Tamar, who had twins by her father-in-law. There was Rahab. You do know about the business, the profession that Rahab was in. 
she was a prostitute who really was used of the Lord when it came time to conquer the city of Jericho. There is probably the best of the lot was Ruth. She was an Arab, and so you have to wonder, how'd she get in there? She had her rightful place. And not only so, but there was a lady by the name of Bathsheba. You do remember about her little encounter with David. And so you have to wonder, and this is just the grace of God, by the way. He does not omit anybody. He is not ashamed to admit that there are people of even a lesser character that he chooses to use. But what I like about the Gospel of Matthew is simply this. The way David begins, the way Joseph begins, the Lord Matthew begins this story. He says, this is the way it happened. This is the way it happened. And so, to understand how it happened, you need to go back a little bit further and understand the customs of the time, which I'm sure this may not come as a total shock or surprise to you, but you need to know it. In that time, it was not unusual for the parents of a young man or the parents of a young girl to bring the two together. The children may not be even older than 13. They may not have anything to say about it. But the mother and the father on either side just saw this as a perfect match and brought them together. And at some point, there was obviously one of two things took place. There was a dowry. There was money that changed hands. And that was kind of a way for the father of the bride to be compensated for any wedding expenses. And then, in some cases, there was a legal document that was, shot, was, that was signed. You have to understand, even though this was considered the period of engagement, the wedding is not going to come until later on, but it's for all intents and purposes, these two people are legally married. With one, one notable exception, they cannot have any physical contact, not at all. And to do so is to be guilty of adultery and to be subjected to being stoned to death. And so you understand the situation. Joseph and Mary have come together. The engagement has taken place. And no matter what, Joseph is one of the happiest men in the world, by the way. He's also one of the poorest men in the world. There's no doubt about it that Joseph and Mary were two very poor people. And the reason we know that was because after the birth of Jesus Christ, when they came to offer sacrifice in the temple, it was either two turtle doves or two pigeons, whichever the case may be. They were only able to bring what was considered the poorest gift that anybody could possibly bring. And so they came and they brought their gift. It was all they had, but they were two people who loved the Lord. They were two people who loved each other. And no doubt, they were not strangers to the Lord. And so one day, their things begin to happen. And I just want to kind of put this in storybook form, if I might, without being disrespectful or irreverent, because I think it's important for us to put ourselves in the moment, live in the moment, and as I've said before, you don't read the Bible like a speeding ticket. You go back and you put yourself in that moment, and so I can see Joseph and Mary being two very happy people. Maybe very well the only time he saw her or she saw him was in the temple when they came to worship. But that's okay. At least they were happy. They were in love. They were engaged. And it was just a matter of time before they would be officially declared man and wife. They would go through their wedding ceremony. And so there came a day when Mary would say to Joseph, and I just envision this. And if you want to fill in any blanks or you want to put your spin on it, that's okay. I'm not calling this a spin. This is kind of how I think it happened. Mary just told Joseph, listen, how about I pack a picnic lunch 
and we go down by the lake and uh, just have some time together. Well, that sounds like a good idea. We'll do that. And so off they go, and down by the lake, and Joseph just says to Mary, is there something going on with you? Uh, you just don't seem like yourself. Why do you ask that? Why do you say that? Well, you just don't seem to be your joyful self. Somehow you just seem like there's something weighing on you, something wearing on you. And uh, she said, well, Joseph, I've been meaning to talk to you. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got a little bit of a problem. Oh, and what was that? Well, you remember when the Lord appeared to Zacharias and told him that his wife was going to have a baby? Well, yeah, what's that got to do with us? Well, I'm going to get to that. I get to that. Do you remember that uh, he doubted what the Lord told him? And he got a case of the lockjaw, and he could not speak until that baby was born. Yeah, I know that. What about that? What's that got to do with us? But Joseph, I got to tell you something. I'm going to have a baby. You're going to have what? You what did you say? I thought you said, Mary. I thought you said we're going to have a baby. Oh, come, quit messing with me. No, Joseph. I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to have a baby. With that, he absolutely wilts. He absolutely shrinks. Mary, I can't believe you do that. I cannot believe you'd be that unfaithful. Joseph, you got to understand, I have not had relationship with any other man. Any man. Mary, please, listen. I'm not very old, and I don't know a lot about the birds and the bees, but I do know if two people, preferably a man and a woman, have to come together in order for you to have a baby. And so, no, I have to tell you how it is. Let me tell you what happened. And she tells him exactly what happened. And by the way, the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary and to Joseph, but I don't believe they appeared to the two of them at the same, at the same time. I really don't. I think the scripture bears that out. Because in Luke chapter 1, the, the angel is named Gabriel, and he comes to Mary and says, Hail Mary, thou art highly favored among men. I heard it said once that God looked through the centuries to find a woman who would be worthy to give birth to the Christ child. And finally he came up, he found a woman by the name of Mary. I totally, wholeheartedly, absolutely disagree with that statement. I believe from the foundation of the world, from the creation of the world, God knew that Mary was going to be the mother of baby Jesus. Nothing he does is by surprise. And so Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that you are going to have a baby. They'll call his name Jesus. He will save the people from their sins. And he's going to be the Savior of the world. Which, by the way, interesting enough, the word Savior is only used three times in the Gospels twice in Luke and once in Matthew. But the name Jesus really says Savior. He's the Savior of the world. And so with that, the angel of the Lord speaks to Gabriel, speaks to Mary, and she raises the question. Zacharias laughed at that same angel. Zacharias laughed when Gabriel told him that his wife, Elizabeth, was going to have a baby. And it wasn't going to be by the Holy Spirit. It was going to be by him. He laughed. And for that, he got a case of being dumb until not being able to speak until the baby was born. Mary asked the question, how is this going to be seeing I haven't known a man? I have not had any sexual relations with a man. How is this going to happen? And the angel graciously and lovingly answers her. And as far as I'm concerned, if you want to have an explanation, and this, by the way, is something that has been under attack since the beginning of Christianity, which is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. There are people who did not, will not accept the fact that he, Mary, was conceived of the birth 
that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you how this happened. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, it tells you all you need to know about his, how this could possibly happen. It says, with God, all things are possible. And I want to tell you, if God can breathe the breath of life into a human being, if God can create a human being by a man and a woman coming together and their sperm contacting, if God can bring a, Christ, a child out of that, God can do anything. There is no problem. It is no problem with God. All things are possible. And so, Joseph, that's what the angel told me. It may be, Mary, it may be, God knows I want to believe you. I never want to not trust you, but I don't understand this. I'm just going to have time. I've got to have time to think this thing through. Okay, Joseph, you take your time, but I'm going to visit Elizabeth. At least she knows something about the angel of the Lord speaking to human beings. And maybe she didn't conceive a child the same way that I did. But nonetheless, it was just as much a miracle of God that she would have a child at this point in her life. Okay, Mary, but I've got to have time to think this thing through. I've got to have time. And so off Joseph goes. And who knows where he went. But I'm guessing that he went for a long walk. You talk about his head spinning. You talk about a man who is just mixed up and doesn't. On one hand, he wants to trust her. He does trust her. He does believe her. But I like the scripture of the man who said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I think that's exactly where Joseph was. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I don't know where he went. Maybe he went up into a cave to find solitude. Maybe he went up on the pinnacle of the temple. Maybe he considered, by the way, taking his own life. After all, this is going to be an embarrassing situation if people find out that Mary has a child and Joseph is not the father. She's going to be condemned to death. And by the way, he has to be the first one to throw the first stone. He has to be the one. So off he goes. Maybe he decided that he'd go up on the pinnacle of the temple. Remember where the Lord, Satan told the Lord, you jump down from the pinnacle of the temple and the angel will bear you up? He didn't fall for that, but maybe Joseph was up in that area. Wherever he is, he obviously went to sleep. And while he was asleep, the angel of the Lord, it doesn't say it was Gabriel, but it was an angel of the Lord, appeared to him and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She's going to have a child, and they're going to call his name Jesus, for he shall save the people from their sins. And so it was. Joseph got up. Oh, thank you, God. So there really is something to this thing about angels. It really is like Mary said. The angel of the Lord really did come to her. The angel of the Lord really did speak to her. The angel of the Lord really did explain to her exactly what was going to happen. It sounds a whole lot like Mary said. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between what the angel said. And so Joseph and Mary now are on their way. They have their engagement consummated in marriage. And now Caesar Augusta has issued a decree, and Joseph and Mary have to make a three-day journey into Bethlehem. And this, by the way, if you're looking for the timeline, this is right at the time that Mary is about to deliver her baby. And so off they go on a three-day journey, a difficult journey. They come to the end. You know the story. There is no room in the end. Well, that wasn't really true either. I still want to get a piece of that innkeeper because he could have given them his room. He could have done something, I believe. But you know what? 
it was all in God's plan. It was all, it's okay, it was all in God's plan. And Joseph, being the carpenter that he was, being handy about working with his hand, being handy with working with wood, could piece together a cattle trough, a manger, if you will, and the Christ child, the Savior of the world, who came from the glories of heaven, now makes his entrance into this world in a cattle trough, in a manger, in Bethlehem. And so it was that Herod decided, I cannot have this threat. I can't have this competition. And so he issued a decree that every baby two years old and under would be killed. And being warned of the Lord, Joseph takes Mary and the baby and goes into Egypt. And he stays there until the death of Herod. And he comes back. And working around the, the carpenter shop, our blessed Lord had the privilege of learning the trade from the best of the best. Although I'm just guessing that Jesus Christ was the best of the best. He didn't need a whole lot of training. But what it must have been like to see the baby Jesus around the carpenter shop kicking that sawdust <laughs> doing whatever he had to do, then we don't know what happened to him. We do know that for all that we can understand, Joseph did not live to be an old man. We know about Mary being at the cross. We don't know anything about Joseph being there. And so I want to tell you that when you want to talk about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. You cannot argue, you cannot deny, you might dispute it, but you cannot deny it and still have any hope of eternal life. And I'll tell you why. You've heard this, but you must never forget it. Every ounce of blood in your body and mine is determined by our Father. That's why you carry your Father's name. You have your Father's blood in your body. And the sin is in the blood. And had Jesus Christ not been born of a virgin, he would have had the same sinful blood that we have, and he would have been disqualified from being the Savior of the world. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. With God, all things are possible. And in that particular area, all things were necessary. It was absolutely essential that the blood of Jesus Christ that flowed through his veins was divine blood. It was heavenly blood. It was God blood. It was not the, not the blood that has been traced everywhere through every generation from Adam right on to the present. Make no mistake about it. And by the way, just as the Holy Spirit gave a new birth, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that same Holy Spirit gives new birth to anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, but will open their heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in. I know I'm a sinful. I know I'm a sinful man because I have that same sinful blood in me. But Lord, I want you to know that I believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit can make me a new creation. With God, all things are possible. You see, repentance is one part. That's your part. Repentance is your part. Repentance is simply changing your mind. That's all it is. You change your mind about who Jesus Christ is. Change your mind about what you have believed, what you have always thought about Jesus Christ. You change your mind about that, and God will change your heart. The Holy Spirit will change your heart. You can say, oh, Pastor, I've, changed, I've tried to change my life. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Only the Holy Spirit can make you a new creation. Just as he brought the Christ child into this world. And so what a moment of joy that must have been when after the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph, he comes back to Mary and he says, Mary, Mary, the Lord talked to me. The angel spoke to me just like he did you. And I now understand, and I'm so thankful 
which by the way, Mary had other children. And so I just want you to know that, that Mary and Joseph did have sexual relations, but not until the scripture says, until after Jesus Christ was born. How faithful, how loving, how trusting. Is there any wonder that God chose that humble, poor carpenter to be the earthly father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That, my friend, was God's plan for redemption. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And now the other part, by the way, he did his. He did his at Bethlehem, and he did his part at Calvary. Now it's your belt, it's your part. Now it's on you, it's on you. As our worship leaders come this morning, we're gonna sing this song, I'd Rather Have Jesus, and I can never sing this song without thinking about Cindy, because this was her favorite song, and I hope it has become you. I hope this is your testimony, I really do. I hope this is your testimony. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. As we come to this time of invitation, I don't have a catchphrase that I use every Sunday. I don't have a pet invitation uh, written out that I use every Sunday. But from time to time, I think it's important for me to tell you what this invitation time is. First of all, always first of all, for anyone who's never trusted Christ as your Savior. And by the way, that may include somebody who's listening by Facebook or YouTube this morning. It doesn't matter. You're here by the Spirit of God. You're joining us. You're part of this church family. You're part of our fellowship this morning, but you've never been a part of the family of God, but you need to be. So first of all, our prayer is for you just take the time, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Lord, I know I'm a Savior. I want to be saved. Lord, I know I cannot save myself. Say it how you want to. But God knows your heart. It's not going to be about what you say. Don't be clever with the words. He, he's not impressed with your words. He knows your heart. He's looking at your heart. God looks on the inside. Man looks on the outside. And so I want to be a Christian. That's all you have to say. God knows. He can take it from there. He can handle that. The second part is you're in this church community. You don't have a church family. You need one. And so we recommend if you don't, if you're not a member of any church, you've made a profession of faith, and maybe you have or have not been baptized. And if you have not, you need to take care of that. We'll not do that right now. We'll wait until summer. Thank you very much. But you need to make that statement. I want to follow the Lord in baptism. And I want to be a part of this church. I want to be a part of a place where I can serve and the church can serve me. It works both ways. And then you want to just come this morning and trust the Lord as your Savior. You want to be a part of this church family. And whatever God has laid on your heart, you need to do it. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. At the marriage feast in Canaan, when they ran out of wine and they came to the Lord's mother, she said, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Somebody called that the best piece of advice in all the Bible. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. This is your time. But when you're talking about gift giving, and I guess your mind has kind of gone in that direction by now. If not, you need to be thinking in that direction. I'll tell you this. The greatest gift you'll ever have is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can't earn it. It's a gift. It's yours to get, his to give, and yours to receive. As we stand, as we sing, I'd rather have Jesus.
shoes to somebody that is going to be very special to you if she doesn't already. She certainly is special to the Lord because he gave his son that all of us together can have eternal life. I want to introduce you to Miss Linda Breeden. Uh, she has been worshiping with us uh, the last few Sundays and uh, interesting enough, members of her family uh, have introduced her to the church and now she has come and talked with me before I worked the service this morning and sort of I kind of knew that she was coming to express her desire to be united in the fellowship of this church by transfer of letters. And so we are just so honored, so happy for you, Ms. Linda, and we just know that this is a decision that the Lord has led you to make, and we just want you to know that we look forward to worshiping, working together, and whatever gift you may have, whatever your strength is, uh, you let us know, because you don't, we'll find out anyway, but uh, that's okay, that's all right, that's okay, but we just want you to know, we just appreciate uh, your being here, and your desire to be a part of this church uh, in the official sense. Obviously, uh, you've been a part as you worship with us, and we pray that your decision will be an inspiration for others to do the same thing, to do likewise. And so uh, we never know how the Lord will use uh, us for uh, a witness to somebody else. And so our prayers with you this morning. I'm going to ask as we have the closing prayer and the closing chorus, if members of the family want to come and be the first to greet her, and then after our service, you be sure to come and let Ms. Linda know that uh, you're happy for her, and you're happy to be a part of her family as she is a part of yours. Father, thank you today for the presence of your spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit to work in this service each and every week. We never know what that's going to be. We never know how it's going to be. We never know how that's going to happen. But like it was with the birth of Jesus Christ, Mary had the question, how's this going to be? And the answer is simply this, with God, all things are possible. And so we just pray and leave the result to God. We do our part. We do what we know we have to do. But in the end, it's going to be the Holy Spirit. It's going to be the power of God that works in people's lives. And we're thankful for that. What a privilege, what an honor to welcome Ms. Linda this morning, to know that she's already a part of the family of God. But now she's come to be a part of the church family. And for that, we thank you. We love you and praise you and worship you in Jesus' loving name. Amen. So you know this is a part of what the angels said to Joseph, but that's going to have to wait until another day. I'm sure that's okay with you. And so as we are dismissed this morning, 
all of God's people join together and say, Thank God for Ms. Linda. Thank God for Ms. Linda. Amen. Amen.